Today's sermon is, Ask Jesus His Way to Pray. There's actually going to be an alliteration, five applications. Attune, admit, attach, ask, and abolish. But if you if you if you're kind of in the uh, if you're in the social media age where you don't have attention for five things, just remember the one thing: ask. Okay, that's the key. Ask. We are moving our way through, and if you're with us for the first time or for the first time in a while, we are working our way through the gospel according to Luke. We come today to the beginning of chapter 11 of Luke's gospel. We're just going to, we're opening up to a season this spring and heading into the early summer will be a focus on prayer and deepening your prayer life. So I want to invite you to engage not only today, but in upcoming Sundays as we learn from Jesus how to pray. Today, we're only going to read verse 1 in the beginning of verse 2 before we ever get to Luke's abbreviated account of some of the words of what we often call the Lord's Prayer. It's really the Lord's way of praying for disciples. So today, Luke chapter 11, verses 1 in the very beginning of verse 2. I invite you to hear now God's word. Now it came to pass, he was in a certain place praying. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you, this is y'all, it's plural, when y'all pray, say, it's plural imperative, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So, do we have any Sunday school teachers here among us? Well, let's put it this way, any moms? Because the first and foremost calling of a mother is to instill the scripture in her children. I mean, if you don't do anything else for your children, the one thing that actually lasts into eternity is instilling the scripture into your children. So, let me ask you this question. In the Gospels, in all four Gospels, what is the only, the only action of Jesus that a disciple asked Jesus to teach them to do? Now, you ought to be able to answer this question because I just read a verse from the scripture where the answer is embedded. Luke chapter 11, verse 1, right? So what is the one action? And you could pull back if I asked you that cold. If I hadn't read Luke 11, 1, you might sit there and say, well, I don't know. If I were with Jesus, I might ask him to teach me how to calm storms. Or if I were a fisherman, I might ask him to teach me how he did that thing where he could say, hey, the fish are there, or throw your notes down, nets down another time and you're going to get a huge catch of fish. I might ask him for that. Teach me how to do that, Jesus. I might ask him to teach me how to heal illnesses. I might ask him to teach me how to cast out demons. I might ask him to teach me how to preach parables. But no, none of those things. Footnote, remember this, when Jesus sent out the 12 apostles, and then later the 72, which we saw, you know, again, sequencing Luke 9 and then Luke 10. He gives them authority to heal and to proclaim the kingdom. He gives them authority to cast out demons. But notice they at this point don't say, well, wait a minute, Jesus, we need a, a, a tutorial. What do we need to know for the test? Uh, it's, it's almost exam time. Let's have a week of study hall with Jesus. No, they don't do that. He does give them authority. And it's just... He's with them. But now, finally you get a question asking Jesus to teach us something that you do, Jesus. Lord, teach us to pray. So what is the key? Disciples? My students, I want you to learn how to read the Bible. What's the key here? If you're six, if you're 86, you can understand this. 
What is the key? What's the key to prayer? What's the key leading into prayer? You want to know the answer? Can you fill in the blank? Blank on the, on the notes there in the bulletin. Ask Jesus. Ask Jesus. We don't like to ask Jesus. We'll ask Jesus after we've asked our best friends, after we've asked the doctor, after we've asked everybody that we think ought to be able to give us answers. The professor, I mean, the wife, the husband. And then when we get in a pinch, if nobody seems to know, finally we'll go to Jesus. I'm suggesting you go to Jesus first and always. Ask Jesus. And the title for our sermon today again is Ask Jesus His Way to Pray. But what is the key to the key? In other words, what's the key overarching behind asking Jesus? And here it is. Don't miss the king. Don't miss who the king is and don't miss a relationship with him. See, it's all about prayer and everything else about salvation. is all about a living relationship with the king. Let me tell you a story. This is just kind of a nice little light story, but last weekend, if you're in this church, you may know that Nancy and I were not here. We were out of town. We had not seen our daughters since Christmas, and so there was all this operation of planning and scheduling in the spring. What weekend we would come to see, to visit Faith in Durham, North Carolina. Remember, she moved to Durham a few blocks from, from Duke University uh, after she graduated from Reform Seminary, and she's involved in a clinical Christian practice there. She's a counselor, Christian counselor. So she lives in Durham. She wanted Grace and Grace's new husband, Christian, to come up and visit. And we would stay with Faith's best friend from college and from college soccer, MK, and MK's husband, Carlos, and their little boy, Henry, who's now a year and a half old. Because MK was upset that last year when we did our visit to Faith in North Carolina uh, over uh, Memorial Day that MK wasn't there. So MK was insistent we needed to come when she was there and she, could, she and Carlos could host us, etc. So we went last weekend. Well, when we arrived and we had dinner Friday night, Carlos, who played college tennis and who then was a coach at Georgia Southern, now he's in insurance and finance stuff, but he said, you're a tennis player. You used to play a lot of tennis. I said, yes, I'm a tennis player. And, he, he, and I said, you know, my wife Nancy was a tennis player too. You know that, right? He said, yeah. And he said, well, listen, tomorrow the Duke tennis team is hosting the regionals um, of the NCAA tennis tournament in men's. And I, I've, I've been following the team. I'm friends with, I know him from church. Uh, MK Carlos and Faith go to Christ Church Central, which is a PCA church in downtown uh, Durham really vibrant church. Uh, she said, he said, I, I know the, you know, the, the brother of the coach who helps coach and I'm really into the team and you like tennis. You know, you used to play competitive tennis. You really, you really ought to go with me. And I said, oh, so you know Trevor? And he said, yeah, you know Trevor? And I said, oh yeah, I know Trevor. And I said, you know, actually I'm, I'm really good friends with Trevor and with Ramsey. Um, you know, I did Ramsey's wedding, right? To, Kathy, and you know they were both number one at Duke and multiple All-American years and such, and I did their wedding back in Hilton Head, like it's, let's see, what, 13, 14 years ago. And so he said, oh, you, you know all of them, and I said, oh yeah, yeah, I said, I'm really good friends with them, so I would love to see them. This was not on my radar, I wasn't planning to do this, I didn't even think last year when we uh, visited Faith, oh, we need to call up Kathy and Ramsey. But I would love to see them. I'd love to see their kids because, you know, Sophie and Shannon are like growing up fast. They're like weeds right now. So he said, okay, well, you definitely, I know Faith wants to take you over to the art museum in Durham, the North Carolina Art Museum, but you should get back in time for the match. So I did. I said, I'll do it. So Faith's like, yeah, yeah, you can do that, Daddy. So anyway, we go to the match. And this was so ironic because Duke was hosting Alabama, whereas 
my baseball team back here, Mississippi State, was hosting Alabama in men's baseball. So anyway, if you're an Alabama fan, I love you, but sorry, I was against Alabama two different totally ways uh, last weekend. So anyway, then we go, to the, we go to the match, and I'm hanging around down you know, on the course because I'm buddies with Ramsey, and I'm talking to Kathy, getting caught up, getting to meet the kids, catching up with Trevor also. And let's go to, yeah, so anyway, when they won, they did win. They beat Alabama. Now, they just lost yesterday defending national champions TCU. And by the way, the Bulldogs, who hosted here last weekend in tennis, just lost to Ohio State uh, in second round. But you'll, this is the team and the coaches and the coaches' families. And then there's some dude way over on the far right who really has nothing to do with Duke tennis, but looks, this is what was posted on X, you know, the, the, the win picture. Uh, so that is the Duke tennis team, and then uh, so you, yeah, I guess kind of Pastor Martin's the chaplain for the Duke tennis team for a day, and then and then I'll show you a picture of this is a picture of yeah that's Ramsey and Kathy and their two kids Sophie and Sandon. So but the real reason see this is all about connections right? So the real reason that I did Logan that's one of the daughters' weddings, and then I did Ramsey's wedding. Part of the connection is. My really good friend, my dear friend, whom I discipled when he joined my church in Hilton Head about six months after I joined there, is, is Ramsey and Trevor's dad, a guy named Stan Smith, who's a big tennis guru guy. And that's a, and so, but I didn't get to see Stan because Stan was out in LA for the premiere of a new documentary about his tennis career and about his friendship with Arthur Ashe and what they did for civil rights and, you know, uh, attacking apartheid in South Africa and that kind of stuff. That's a picture of Stan in one of his Wimbledon wins right there. But that's, that's I just pulled that picture from an LA uh, newspaper last week because Stan texts me and says, I'm so sorry I'm not there. I'm so glad you can be there for Ramsey. So all of this to say, it's all about relationships, right? It's about our relationship with the king is the big relationship. So I want to encourage you today when we talk about prayer and begin to talk about prayer, the whole point of this is don't miss the king. Don't miss the king. Don't miss the real thing. Prayer is not about saying some words and hoping it registers with God somewhere out there. That's what pagans did in the time of the New Testament. You are invited into a living relationship with the king. A communion with him and that is the lifeblood of prayer and the goal of prayer a living relationship with the king now can you imagine it's Mother's Day right happy Mother's Day again to all our mothers can you imagine if uh, you know your family hosts a big Mother's Day luncheon or dinner or celebration or whatever and one of the kids comes to the Mother's Day celebration but his own, you know, on his or her phone the whole time and stepping out, talking to people that he or she is really interested in, not saying a word to mom, maybe kind of dropping off a card because everybody's dropping off a card, saying, hey, mom, and moving on. Does that touch your heart? Does that, like, really sound like a great Mother's Day? No, because you missed the relationship, right? Well, let me go a little bit deeper. Imagine you live in a powerful nation ruled by a really good king, the most powerful person in the world. And one day, he invites you to his great annual celebration of, you know, remembering the anniversary of his coronation and celebrating his reign as king. And imagine you go, and it's an awesome celebration. It goes on for several days, great gifts for all the invitees, great food. You know, you get to bring home some Fabergé eggs that you're thinking about, wow, if I could sell these on the market, I can really make some money about them. And you're thinking about all the advantages to you of being at this party, right? But, but as you come into the central area of the party, there is the king himself up on the throne, and he has his arms wide open to all who will come to him, all who love him. And there, there's just a stream of people going up talking to the king congratulating the king, singing praises to the king, relating personally to the king. But you never go up there because you're too busy with your own affairs, you know? You're checking the sports scores. You're checking stuff that's really important to you. You're making plans for your 
weekend trip to the beach after this party. You're talking to the people that you went to school with that were in fraternity or sorority with you or, or that you're planning a hunting trip with or that you hang out and go shopping with. And you know what? You never give a moment, a serious moment to the king. That whole time, that whole time you're at the grand festivities, you never go up to the king and ask him, what are your plans for me? What do you need me to do for you, O king? And I love you, king. Thank you so much for inviting me. I don't deserve to be at this celebration. But, you know, you invited me. You're so awesome. Thank you for your grace. You never do that because, you know what, you're just too busy. Maybe you'll get around to it next year's party, <laughs> but you just don't have time. Now, of course, this parable that I'm giving you is exemplary of the way a whole lot of Americans who call themselves Christians treat the real king, right? I mean, you're like you at the party, when everybody stands up and says, long live the king, you say it too. And if they ask you, do you believe he's the king? You would say, oh yeah, he's the king. I just don't give any time to him. I mean, I'll say all the grand affirmations when everybody else stands up because I, I want to look okay with everybody else, right? And when we sing some song to the king, I'll sing some song to the king. But I don't have a personal relationship with him. I don't have time for him. I'm busy. I've got serious stuff going on in my life. A lot more important than the king. See, you wouldn't be attuned to the king at all, would you? And practically speaking, you are living as if he doesn't exist. And that is the way many people who call themselves Christians are living right now. <gasps> And the truth is, when this brief life is done, and each of us comes before the judgment seat of the living Lord, the Lord says we will be judged by our words. And the truth is, before we even get to, which this will all be before the Lord, your, your calendar, your schedule, how you spent your time, your finances, all that kind of stuff, you know, did you actually believe in the king or not? Before you even get to that, our prayer lives will be laid before the Lord. And it's pretty obvious. You don't have to be, I mean, I'm, I'm way down low, but I don't have to be at that divine level to start figuring out where people are based on their prayer lives in their relationship with the king. Jesus says at the judgment, a whole lot of people are gonna to come to him and say, Lord, Lord, we said Lord, Lord to you. And he's gonna say, I never knew you. I never knew you. May that not be the case with you. I pray that you are living in a vibrant relationship and prayer life with the Lord right now. I pray that every day, all through the day, you are praying without ceasing in conversation with and opening your heart to the living Lord. If you are not, I want to invite you today and throughout this season as we learn about how to pray to open up to the king. I don't want you to miss the king. See, because prayer flows from and into a living relationship with him. That's the key to the key. The key to the key of asking Jesus. You've got to, like, turn to him, okay? You've got to go to him. And that leads us into, number one, attune ourselves to Jesus, our Lord and our advocate. Now, initially I said affirm, but the truth is you're going to affirm him, but there's a whole lot of people, like I just said, who so-called affirm him who don't attune themselves to him. I'm asking you to actually turn to him, put your focus on him. Um, here's the reality. And moms, this is a reality for you. Every single one of us, will affirm and attune ourselves to someone or something. That's what we do in life. What or whom are you thinking about in the morning when you're driving around? What or whom do you look to for your information, for your sense of having a purpose or knowing what's going on? You're gonna attune to something or someone. Now, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter eight, verse six, he cuts to the chase on this, he says, to set the mind on the flesh, in other words, to attune to the flesh, is death. 
but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. To set your mind on the things of the flesh, that's death. That's going to lead to death, like eternal death, ultimately. But to set the mind on the Spirit, the Spirit of God is life and peace. So I want to invite you to ask yourself today, and maybe throughout this week in your devotional time in prayer life with the Lord, what am I paying attention to? And what seems to draw my attention? If I'm on my smartphone, what seems to pop up that really drags me in the wrong direction or maybe away from most important things or from the Lord. Paul says, and the rest of the scripture confirms this, that what I affirm by attuning my attention to it will end up coming back and ruling me. Okay, whatever you set your mind on will come back and rule you and define you. You will become shaped and led in who you are by what you're focusing on. And I'm inviting you to focus much higher than most people do. And moms, the reality is our children will affirm and attune themselves to someone or something. Are they attuned to Jesus? Thank you for being here in service today. I'm a little bit preaching to the choir. If you're watching this online, hey, invitation here. Now, speaking of moms and parents right now, obviously the hot topic of this spring, among other things, is the latest book, the huge, massive bestseller by NYU social psychologist Jonathan Haidt. You know, you've heard me in previous sermons refer a couple years ago to some of his other books, like The Coddling of the American Mind. Well, he's got another hot one out right now. The Anxious Generation, how the rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness. Now, this book came out in March. It is the hot bestseller right now, and everybody's talking about it. I'm guessing if you're in circles with other moms, moms, y'all are hopefully talking about this a little bit more than kind of lower level superficial things. And we all need to deal with this. I mean, he is calling for a revolution, of course. Let me remind you, as I've told you before, John Hyde is not a Christian. He's a secular atheist. But some of the things he studies are very informative to us in our own lives. And he is calling right now for a revolution where parents do not allow their children under the age of 16 to have smartphones in the first place and definitely to be off social media after, you know, on into their late teens. Because he sees, he's studying what has happened over the last 10 years to the psyche and the society that's being brought up on smartphones, digital, and all the current stuff. Now, this book is being hailed by the full spectrum, all the way from Oprah Winfrey, all the way over to, yeah, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, not only is promoting the book, but sent a copy to every single governor in the United States, and not only every state, but every territory. She says, we all need to look at this and try to figure out what we're doing as leaders. So again, for our call today, attune ourselves to Jesus, our Lord and advocate. The key word here in our passage for this point is, one of the disciples turns to Jesus and says, Lord, this is not a ritual. He's, he's for real when he says this. And this takes us on Ascension Sunday. Certainly this timing caused me to reflect on who Jesus is as our advocate at the right hand. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And what this verse is saying is we need to attune ourselves to the ascended advocate who is at God's right hand. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, fix our eyes on Jesus. In other words, attune ourselves to Jesus. Look up to Jesus. The author and perfecter of our faith. Now, that's an incredible statement. In other words, he's already completed our faith. Okay? You don't have to add on. All you need to do is look to him, right? The author, the originator, and the perfecter of faith who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. What was he looking towards at the cross? What was Jesus looking towards? Well, this tells us, despising the shame and, in other words, in his ascension, 
set down at the right hand of God's throne. So there you've got the ascension and who Jesus is as your advocate. Now we know that this disciple asking this question and the other disciples, it's seen that Jesus consistently prayed intensely. He would go off for hours on end to pray. I've already done another sermon. Just go back to the New Year's Eve sermon, December 31st, 2023, that was titled First Pray. And I take you through a lot of the sequences where in every major turning point in Jesus' ministry, he prays intensely. And his disciples are seeing this. Now, he's the son of God, but he spends hours on end praying. Pull out of Luke, and let me just go back to where we are in the sequence right now, kind of leading up to this. You'll remember in the transfiguration, when Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, remember when is he transfigured? While he is praying. Okay. Then he's coming down from the transfiguration. And, and Mark tells us an interesting twist on this sequence where this man whose son is demon-possessed comes to Jesus and says, I asked your disciples to cast out the demon, but they could not. And Jesus says, he says, but, but if you can do anything, please help me. <laughs> and Jesus says, do, do anything. Everything's possible to the one who believes. Do you believe? And the guy says, I believe, help my unbelief. Okay? But after Jesus cast out the demon, Mark tells us this in, in chapter 9, verse 29. The disciples ask him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So Hebrews 12, 2 is telling us we need to fix our eyes on Jesus in his ascension, who is at the right hand of God's throne. And Hebrews chapter 4, picking up at verse 14, tells us we need to approach. This is about prayer now. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. In other words, who has ascended to the right hand on high, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us then with confidence, this is how we come to pray to him, with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. You understand when you come to pray, it's a throne of grace, and Jesus is your advocate inviting you to the throne. It's awesome. By his bloodshed, you may approach. The dividing wall and the veil have been cast aside. You can come. Okay, so attune ourselves to Jesus, our Lord, and our advocate. This is awesome. He's on your side, okay? She's with me, Father. He's with me. Come on, come on. Number two, admit we are children totally needing him and his teaching. Now, this is where a lot of people fail to become Christians because we're really proud of ourselves and we're really proud of how smart we are. And we're really proud in some cases of all the religious traditions we have. We don't really need Jesus to teach us because we already know. Now, let me remind you that these disciples of Jesus, they knew how to pray a whole lot more than most Christians I know. They basically all could sing the entire Psalter. Okay, you understand this, right? That they would break into the Psalter with Jesus. If you watch The Chosen, I think it's really realistic when they suddenly break into quoting Isaiah and quoting Psalms and praying through them. That, that's, they can do that. I mean, can you do that? They have the Amidah with the 18 benedictions. Do you even know 18 benedictions? They have the Kedushah in the midst of the Amidah. They have all kinds of prayers. The Jewish Siddur now, some versions of it, is a thousand pages of prayers and prayer instruction. They can say, we don't need Jesus to teach us to pray. We got the whole book on it, right? And I know a lot of people who say, I got the book of common prayer. I got the book of this or that. I got, you know. But God bless this one disciple who gets it. We're babies. We don't know. Praying is talking to the living Almighty. Will you admit you're a child and ask Jesus instead of doing it your way? Will you? That is the key move. That's a key move of salvation, and that is a key move of prayer. Admit we're children, totally needing his teaching. His teaching. We need his teaching. Jesus says, this is Luke 18. Whoever does not receive God's kingdom like a child 
shall not enter in. And you will never connect with him in prayer unless you come to him as a child. We'll drill down on that when we see the way Jesus is going to teach us to pray. So that's second. Admit we're children totally needing him and his teaching. And yeah, they're also asking to be set apart as his disciples and his church. But number three, attach to him and to one another. Now these two go together. Attach to him and to one another as his church. Jesus says, I am the vine, you, plural, are the branches. Can a branch be off by itself, disconnected from the vine, or unaffiliated with the other branches? No. Attach. Attach to him. This is key to prayer. Attach to Jesus and to his church. In Ephesians 4, Paul says this, we, as his body, are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. So we're a body together. The body's not supposed to be severed. The body is together as the church. Experts who study attachment tell us that our yearning for attachment is already in full force from the time a baby is born. And moms, you know this, right? Moms, you know this. When a baby is born, what is a baby looking for? Attachment. Right? Um, Dr. Kurt Thompson, a Christian psychiatrist, love his writing, In the Soul of Shame, he says this, we all are born into the world looking for someone looking for us. We are all looking for someone looking for us. And we remain in this mode of searching the rest of our lives. Mothers, you need to know that. We all need to know that. This is how God wires us. And Kurt Thompson asked pointedly, whom are you looking for in your life? Because, of course, we need to look for Jesus. Jesus calls us to attach to him and attach to one another as his church. And then fourth, of course, this is the key to the whole sermon, really, Ask Jesus to teach us his way to pray. His way to pray. My grandmother taught me, I don't need any help. No, no, no. Ask Jesus, seriously. Ask Jesus his way. Martin Luther, in his great, I mean wonderful, um, extended instruction to his barber. Remember how his barber asked Luther how to pray? And he writes this 42-page instruction. Luther says in the midst of that, it's shameful that the Lord's prayer and the Lord's teaching on prayer is treated so carelessly by many who thoughtlessly rattle it off, though they might pray it their way. Do you catch what Luther's saying? Though they might pray it their way a thousand times, they have not benefited at all. It's not about saying words, friend. Teach us to pray. And so Jesus said to them, when you, it's plural there, you, when y'all, when y'all pray, and then the imperative is plural also. You all need to be together to say. In other words, Jesus' way is for us to pray connected to him as his church together. When you pray, even if you're individually, physically on an island, by yourself. You never pray alone because the Holy Spirit, Christian, is in you. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is with you. The Lord is with you. And you are called to pray and understand you're praying with the body. Even if you're by yourself on an island. This is the way Jesus is going to teach us to pray. If you say, no, I, I just kind of pray my own thing. I'm just Martin off to myself. You're not praying in Christ. You're not praying his way. So ask Jesus to teach us to pray his way. And then fifth, and this is really for all of us, but definitely for moms, maybe for some of our moms. Abolish anxiety by praying. Abolish anxiety by praying. Always giving thanks in Christ. Again, we've got height with the anxious generation and 
We don't even need his book that came out in March to tell us uh, anxiety is through the roof and a whole lot of people are very anxious and depressed and concerned about all kinds of things, right? So how do we deal with that? How do we lead and teach our children? Pray. Real prayer. In Christ and in the power of his Holy Spirit. Abolish anxiety by praying. Always giving thanks in Christ. If you do not know Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, you need to learn it. Moms, all of us, right? Do not be anxious about anything. Abolish anxiety, right? But in everything, how do we do this? In everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make your request known to God. And what's the promise of verse 7? And the peace of God which transcends all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds, right? See, we have, this is incredible, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous. That's the way John puts it. He's at the right hand. Romans 8, 34, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, was raised. Who is at the right hand of God? who indeed is interceding for us. Jesus is praying for you. Will you join him? <laughs> and then Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. In other words, who come to him now. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. You know, Jesus lives to make intercession for you. Will you come to him? Will you come to the Father? So here's the invitation today. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of prayer. And ask him, ask him to pray his way. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.